Oversexed. Every unit had their company hall master. Overpaid. Us American boys had so much more money than what the British boys had. And over there, D-Day was a turning point of World War II, but it wasn't all blood and guts. I encountered my first romance in France, and that was a lady who was peddling you know what. This woman may have been the most effective spy of the war. Apparently, Betty was very willing to use her body towards the Allied cause. And this man may have been the war's biggest prude. The political leader most faithful to his woman was Adolf Hitler. These are the intimate stories of war swept under history's rug until now. Sex in World War II, the European front, next. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. From that moment until August 1945, 11 million American GIs would endure the horrible experience of all-out war. they would also discover ways to alleviate the horror. War is an extreme situation where everything is on the line and where the major emotions you're battling are boredom and fear. And one of the ways to overcome both boredom and fear is to be sexual. During the Second World War, sexual behavior between consenting adults reached a crescendo. Nowhere did this occur more than in the European theater. For many young American men, the journey began with a boat ride to Great Britain in the early spring and summer of 1942. The British, who'd been fighting the Nazis for nearly three years, sarcastically called this the American invasion. There was a song there that had about 30 verses, and it started out, we dreaded the invasion, well, it's come, but alas, it's not the bloody hun. Goddamn Yankee armies come. But this was no joke. By fall 1942, a quarter million young American men were on British soil, and many fell into the arms of lonely English women. A woman's husband may already have been killed in the war, or she hasn't heard from him for two or three years. I think that, in fact, did lead to a huge number of liaisons by men and women who ordinarily wouldn't have had them. War records show that some of these Anglo-American relationships resulted in marriage. We know that there was somewhere in the region of 70,000 GI brides. Other liaisons had a much different result. Between 1940 and 1945, of 250,000 births in England, 105,000 of them were illegitimate. These marriage and birth figures provide hard evidence to chronicle relations between British women and American men. But the soft evidence suggests that sexual encounters were even more common than raw statistics reveal. The, the great saying for, for the GIs was, oversexed, overfed, overpaid, and over here. We got paid a lot higher wages. Girls are like all girls. They like to have money spent on them and so forth, you know. And we did. U.S. Army Air Corps Sergeant Ernest King was a gunner on this B-17 bomber, the Chugalug Lulu. King was stationed in England for seven months. He was nice to English girls, and they was nice to us. And I'll admit, I was always looking for a girl. As many English girls said, they also had film star good looks. They were polite, they were courteous, and uh, as was often said, they were a breath of fresh air. Most GIs were stationed in the English countryside, where the US Army and Air Corps had most of their camps and bases. 
very likely that GIs would meet lonely women in the more remote villages. You had uh, many widows from uh, the First World War. Uh, you had many girls whose husbands were away at the war. And uh, the bases would throw dances. One GI who found love in the English countryside was Corporal Sidney Foreman. He arrived in 1943, a mere boy of 18, still a virgin to war and sex. On his first visit to a local pub, Foreman met an English girl. There was a woman sitting across the room. She was the only one in there, a very attractive, tall, stately girl. Her name was Nancy. After chatting over tea, they made plans to see a movie the next week. And I was really surprised when I found out that she evidently came prepared for more than just watching the movie, because as she nestled in, she drew my hand into her body. I realized she had nothing on under the sweater. Up until that time, I, I had never done anything but talk to a girl. Now suddenly I'm there, and um, it was exciting. I wasn't really sure what I was doing, but I knew I was enjoying it. And I was really, really anticipating what was coming next on our next meeting. That next meeting came the following week. This time we met after a lunch on a Sunday, and we suddenly found ourselves in a very secluded area. And the next thing we knew, she lifted her skirt. I mean, before I knew it, we were having a sexual act right there in the open, covered by this big skirt, which is evidently the reason she wore it. And uh, it was a little embarrassing for me because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Sidney Foreman's stay in England lasted more than a year. During that time, he dated Nancy regularly. But she wasn't his only girl. Foreman, like so many other GIs, also met women in London. London was the mecca. By the time the Americans arrived, London had undergone the Blitz. London was virtually devastated by war. Morale had been fairly low among the women. And of course, then suddenly, this exotic breed of uh, American GIs turn up. And it's too easy because the honest truth is that probably the English women were worse than the GIs and they would follow them around. You had what were called the good time girls. They would stand around on street corners and they would make it known to the Americans that they were available. The center for action was London's famed Piccadilly Circus. Piccadilly Circus has always been a gathering spot, and many people the world over would recognize Eros as the symbol of the circus. But during the Second World War, Eros was taken down, and hoarding had been put up all around the fountain. And in fact, this is a place where American GIs would gather to ogle and whistle at the women and the girls as they passed by. There were always women around Piccadilly Circus. Some were unabashed prostitutes, so bold the GIs gave them a military-sounding nickname. This area was the area for the Piccadilly Commandos. These were the ladies of the night, the prostitutes, who used to stand in the doorways and shine torches onto their ankles. And the nickname came from the fact that they were very quick in servicing their clients. GIs had several popular hangouts around Piccadilly Circus. There was the Windmill Theatre, which became famous in London because it never closed during the entire war. They did basic uh, theatrical pieces, but more importantly, they had nude ladies on stage. They had nude reviews. And uh, the Windmill Theatre became part of London wartime legend. Not least, of course, because we never closed, but, but also because every serviceman knew of the Windmill Theatre. It was the place to go. Another place to go was popularized by a song of the day called Underneath the Arches. In London, it was very common for couples to seek privacy in the darkened arches underneath the railroad stations. Sidney Foreman learned about this while walking a girl home from a dance. We went through the arches, and as we got into the arch, she stopped and she suddenly became amorous. And the next thing I knew, she was leaning against the wall, and she braced herself against the wall. I was leaning against her, 
And we had one wild sexual encounter right there under the arches. It was actually known as a wall job, and it was based on the belief among many British girls that you couldn't get pregnant if you had sex standing up and fully clothed against the wall. Sidney Foreman had no trouble finding romance during his time in England. But like most American GIs, he left Great Britain as suddenly as he had arrived. His outfit moved out just before D-Day, joining the Normandy invasion. And I never did get to call Nancy again. I couldn't call her, tell her goodbye, I, nothing. It was just, that was it, it was over. Sidney Foreman's days in England may have been over, but his nights of romance were not. In the coming years, Foreman, along with countless other GIs, would find willing sexual partners on the European continent. As one anonymous woman said, we weren't immoral, there was a war on. One of the important questions to ask about sex is what for? And in European civilization as late as 15, 1600, there was only one justification for doing sex, and that was to make babies. The second purpose after procreation for sex is power. No figure in World War II was more driven by lust for power than Adolf Hitler. In his personal quest for world domination, Hitler used sex to further the dreams of his Third Reich. But he did so in a surprising way. The political leader most faithful to his woman and least likely to stray was Adolf Hitler. Eisenhower had his mistress, and de Gaulle was hardly spot free, and Roosevelt had his mistress and down the line. Hitler fits the American standard for sexual purity better than anybody else. Indeed, Hitler was, was in his personal behavior, a, a man of very strong uh, morality. So, you know, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and he was very strict also in his imagination how his guys should behave. While personally chased by most accounts, Hitler's perversion was his dream of selective procreation to create a pure master race. During the war, this twisted ideology resulted in a number of edicts and programs regulating sexuality in the Third Reich. One perverse Nazi program was called Lebensborn. It was the idea of Hitler's trusted lieutenant, Heinrich Himmler. He was a maniac in founding a new race, a new nation, and a great Germany. That's ruling all over the world. He was quite crazy in this thing. Lebensborn has been Aryan race bordellos, SS prostitute orgies. They've been called everything you can imagine, but basically Lebensborn stands for the Fount of Life Foundation. And it was a program that was set up in 1935 to help unwed mothers raise their children if they had Germanic characteristics. Later, it also included the attempt to try and get SS men and genetically correct mothers together to try and breed blonde, blue-eyed, tall Germans. The program became Himmler's obsession he involved himself in explicit detail, sometimes even dictating methods of copulation and conception. Himmler, who was the head of the SS, had some bizarre ideas about how to breed the perfect German. He thought an SS troop that had gone out and exercised very strenuously was at his prime if he came back and immediately copulated with a woman who should be waiting there in bed, totally dormant, waiting for him. Himmler recruited men from his own SS troops. The women, young and beautiful, were recruited from all over Europe. The meeting places were often resort-like in location and appearance. For the man, it was almost a sexual vacation. For the woman, it was duty. If she conceived, she went to a Lebensborn home where she was cared for through childbirth. Rumors have said that this Lebensborn was nothing else than a sort of a better brussel. But this isn't, was indeed not the reality. It was a sort of a maternity home with a special rules. 
The historic results of Himmler's diabolical program are the tragic Lebensborn children. A lot of these children, it is estimated about 7,000, are living today without knowing who are their real parents. Lost in the layers was a moral peculiarity of German culture, which probably saved the lives of thousands of downed Allied airmen. The Germans, in rigid fashion, regarded sexual relations between a man and woman to be a strictly private matter, whether in the bedroom of a husband and wife, a Lebensborn resort, or in a brothel. Even the Gestapo would not break in on somebody that was in sexual intercourse with a woman. And this enabled the resistance in France and other countries to basically hide airmen by pretending that they were having sex with these women behind closed doors and the Germans wouldn't break in on them, incredible as it may seem. It was called the closed house or closed door system. If the Nazis raided a house where an airman was hiding, the airman was told to go to a room with a girl, close the door, and get busy. Among those to benefit from the closed door system was Sergeant Ernest King. His B-17 was shot down over Belgium in August 1943. Aided by the French resistance, King spent the next nine months evading the Germans. It was a good organization they had. I stayed in Belgium and I moved over into Paris. The brothels were not just hiding places. Because they were patronized by partisans and Germans alike, the houses became havens for gathering and dispensing information, misinformation, and disinformation. It was one of the best organizations I had seen. They had a beautiful gal that was an actress. Her job was to go to bed with the officers and get what information she could out of them. The French women were very bold when it came to hiding Allied airmen, as Sergeant King learned in Paris. Madame Simone, she was a widow woman, 45 years old. And she, her philosophy was, if you go out, go where the Germans go. They won't suspect you. We'd go to restaurants and eat. We could go to movies. We could go have picnics in the grounds next to the Eiffel Tower. So we got around quite a bit. Getting around included frequent visits to friendly bedrooms. One thing about them, uh, French, even though the Germans had taken over their country, they were still fun-loving people. So we had some good times there, but you always had to worry about getting caught. Fear of capture was a constant concern for downed airmen and resistance operatives. For those engaged in espionage, the risks were even greater. This included the most successful female spy of the war. For her, sex was the ultimate weapon. She was absolutely beautiful, addicted to danger, and a dedicated patriot. Amy Elizabeth Thorpe, who's better known to history by her married name, Betty Pack, and under the code name of Cynthia, was the most effective female spy in World War II. She was a very beautiful girl, five foot seven, amber blonde hair, patrician features, large green eyes, and a charming laugh, apparently. And there was something in her that if she decided she wanted a man, that was it, she could get him. Amy Elizabeth Betty Thorpe was born in 1910, the daughter of a distinguished American military attaché. By all accounts, she was a precocious child. By age 19, she was a debutante in Washington society. In 1929, she met Arthur Pack, a 38-year-old English diplomat, twice her age. She seduced him, and then they married. She was a bit of a trophy wife, really. He wasn't unhappy about it. The only thing is, I think that they were not very well matched. He was not a highly sexed man, and she was clearly a highly sexed woman. 
1937, Arthur Pack was sent to Poland to work in the British Embassy. Unbeknownst to him, this would be the beginning of Betty's career as a British intelligence agent. She hadn't been there very long when she began an affair with a, a young neighbour, a young diplomat called Kulikowski. And as a result of pillow talk, she was hearing things that she knew would be of interest. Particularly, he gave her information on the annexation of Czechoslovakia. And she knew who to take this information to. And as a result of that, she was recruited uh, into intelligence. Apparently, Betty was very willing to use her body towards the Allied cause, and she probably enjoyed herself a lot, too. She certainly was able to seduce men and enjoyed their company. Once recruited by the British, Betty was given a specific person to seduce, the military attaché to Poland's Minister of Defense. Sure enough, it was just not very long before bunches of roses were arriving in poetry and he was inviting her out to dinner. He was madly in love with her, she was madly in love with him. While the attaché slept at night, Betty rifled through the classified documents in his briefcase. Significantly, she gleaned information that Poland was decoding Germany's top secret Enigma ciphers. Although Betty wasn't a great cog in the Enigma wheel, she was certainly an important early part of British knowledge about Enigma. Unfortunately, Betty's work in Poland came to an abrupt end when her source, blinded by love, told his boss about the affair. This created a minor diplomatic scandal, which led to the end of Betty's spying in Poland. But it was not the end of her spying. In 1939, Arthur Pack was sent to Chile. Once there, Betty resumed her life as a diplomat's wife. But when all-out war exploded across Europe that September, Betty left Arthur, effectively ending their marriage. She returned to Washington, D.C., where she hoped to resume her spy career. The British were very eager to have Betty back at work. She was given a code name, Cynthia, and a new assignment to infiltrate the Italian embassy in Washington, D.C. Her target was a high-ranking diplomat, Admiral Alberto Ley. They had no idea, there was no way they could have known this, but curious coincidence, Betty already knew this man. Betty had met Alberto Ley at a diplomatic function when she was a teenager. When they met again, he remembered her. There's no question that Betty portrayed herself to Ley as a sort of Lolita. He obviously liked young ladies, and the younger the better. After seducing Ley, Betty was given her task, steal top secret Italian naval codes from the Admiral. Brazenly, she just asked him directly, allegedly while in bed. Big shock to him, I should think. He said he would think about it the next day he came back. He didn't say no, he didn't give her the ciphers, but what he did do was he gave her an introduction to the cipher clock and said to Betty she would have to contact this man directly. Betty got the codes, exactly how she never revealed, but the result was dramatic. On March 28, 1941, the British Navy crippled the Italian fleet at the Battle of Matapan. The very next night, Alberto Ley told Betty another important war secret. He confessed to her that he'd had orders that day to scuttle any Italian ships that were in US ports. There were, I believe, 28 ships at the time. And Betty just couldn't wait, really, for him to leave. Betty hustled the admiral out of her apartment, then immediately called her contact. The intelligence prevented a mass scuttling of Italian ships in strategic American ports. But it was also the end of her affair with the admiral, as he was recalled to Italy. There was a price to be paid with a liaison with Betty, and this Italian admiral paid the full price because he was discredited and disgraced and ruined as a result of what he did with her. Miraculously, Betty's cover was not compromised. So she was given another task, 
she was told to infiltrate the French embassy in Washington and obtain the secret naval codes of the French fleet, the fourth largest navy in the world. Because France was under Nazi control, nobody knew for sure which side the French Navy would fight for. Thus, the movements of the fleet were of paramount concern to the Allies, especially because of the pending invasion of North Africa in 1942. To accomplish her mission, Betty posed as a Washington Society writer and obtained access to the embassy. She targeted the French press attaché, a married man named Charles Bruce. Within days, they were sleeping together. Once again, Betty played her hand in bed. Feeling bold, she simply asked Bruce to give her the French naval codes. He said to her, why are you doing this? And she said, I'm doing it for France. I want to save France. To gain his confidence, Betty attacked on two fronts. She appealed to his manhood, and to his patriotism, convincing him that the Allied cause was just. By doing so, she successfully turned Bruce to the Allied side. But he still balked at giving her the codes. This, he told her, was absolutely impossible. There were two books. The ciphers consisted of two books the size of large family Bibles. They were only ever out of the safe in control of the cipher clerk. When this wasn't happening. They were locked in a safe in the office, and it, at night the embassy was patrolled by a security guard. Betty was not deterred. After mulling her options with Bruce, she plotted to break into the embassy safe at night. But the plan was anything but conventional, as reenacted in this 1980 BBC docudrama. He made friends with the security guard, and. He confided in the security guard that he had this American girlfriend, um, that he had nowhere to take her to make love to her, and he persuaded the man to allow him to bring this woman back to use his office as a romantic trysting place. In the meantime, Betty was having crash lessons in safe-breaking. Betty and Charles Bruce established their cover by showing up several times before the planned break-in. Then, on the appointed night, they arrived with champagne and disappeared into Bruce's office. Betty wasn't wholly convinced that they had convinced the guard with this cover story, and so she insisted that they both strip. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, the guard suddenly threw open the door without knocking. And what he found, of course, was Charles Bruce stark naked and Betty standing in front of him with a shocked look and the guard smiled and withdrew, and so it was quite a clever move on her part, I think. Uh, and she then went to work. With privacy assured, Betty opened the safe, then passed the code books out a window to a waiting accomplice. They were photographed and returned within an hour. Once again, Betty had accomplished her mission. A little while after that, the Americans landed in North Africa in an operation called Torch. And one of the chiefs in charge of that landing did contact Betty after them to tell her that the codes had been of immeasurable value to them. And um, he actually wrote to Betty that her work had changed the course of the war. While the operation had ended, Betty Pack's love affair with Charles Bruce did not. They got married after the war, and she moved to France, where she lived with Charles for the rest of her life. In 1963, shortly before she died of throat cancer, Betty was asked if she was ashamed of her method of spying. She responded, I was able to make certain men fall in love with me, or think they had at any rate, and in exchange for my love, they gave me information. Ashamed? Not in the least. Wars are not won by respectable methods. One tries to win anyway, anyway. Betty Pack's naked burgling of the French embassy in Washington, D.C. had a direct impact on the Allied invasion of North Africa in November 1942. This was America's first big entry into the European theater of the war. 
Americans hadn't fought in Africa before, so it was a new experience for nearly every soldier in uniform. George Doc Abraham was a newlywed, having married his childhood sweetheart, Katie, just months before shipping out to Africa. I didn't want to get married because I didn't want to come back all shot up and everything. And she says, you won't come back shot up, you're going to come back safe and sound. We're going to get married. Abraham was part of a top secret outfit, U.S. Army Task Force 5889. Its mission was not to fight German Field Marshal Rommel's Panzer Corps in the North African desert, but to guard a vital rubber plantation in West Africa, the Firestone Plantation near Monrovia, Liberia. One million acres of rubber trees and the Allies needed rubber to move on. That's why we were sent there to protect it from the Germans. Task Force 5889 was a unique outfit, one of the first fully integrated units in the U.S. Army. It had 72 white American soldiers and officers and 2,000 enlisted men of African American descent. For all of them, West Africa couldn't have been a more foreign and dangerous place. Mosquitoes and snakes and boredom was just as bad as anything you could get. And the big thing was malaria. You couldn't work or fight if you had malaria. In addition to bugs and reptiles, the men of Task Force 5889 quickly learned about another danger to their health. They found out they could get sexual gratification from the local people. These girls would come into the uh, tents at night or invite the people to come to their own places. And in the process of doing that, they picked up malaria. It wasn't just malaria, either. Within a month, the VD rate among the US troops was up 1,000%. And there was another hidden danger, jealousy. The local men didn't like the idea of their girls and their wives making good money from the American soldiers. And sometimes they would kill off some of the Americans or get them drunk and they push them in the river. Between VD, malaria, and jealousy, Task Force 5889 was losing manpower. The Army had to do something. And it was a very unique thing. And I think it was the right thing to do. They developed a couple of brothels they took native girls from the bush and put them into a compound. One was called Shangri-La, the other is called Paradise. It was possibly the most straightforward program ever instituted to deal with the issue, and maybe the most controversial and top secret. Well, I think the reason why the stories had never been told, the Army felt that the people would complain because a lot of do gooders would say, that's an awful way to treat boys, let them have their own prostitutes over there. And that's why they kept it secret. And it was super secret. Nobody knew about it. And they threatened to court martial anybody who even talked about it. The two brothels, Paradise and Shangri-La, were built and operated by the Army. Most significantly, only black troops were allowed entry, no whites. Doc Abraham observed this top secret program for two years and chronicled it in photographs. In the year 2000, he published a definitive book on the subject, The Bells of Shangri-La. In it, Abraham described the brothels as little more than rustic compounds, each containing a number of one-room bamboo huts. At night, the MPs would let the soldiers in there, and this is for the black troops only. They go in there from 6 o'clock at night till 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, the MPs would blow the whistle and clear them out. Under Army sanction, the brothels were strictly monitored by the Medical Corps. The Army sanitized the areas. They dropped Dixie cups around the place with the DDT, and they killed off the mosquitoes. Sunday mornings, they would inspect these girls by Army officers or doctors. If any of them were found by disease, they put them in a place called Idle Wild, and they were treated there with the best knowledge they had. The brothel rates varied. 
from $0.25 cents a visit in the beginning up to $20 when the program hit high gear. I saw one girl, she made $2,000 one night, and she said, and she spoke in broken English, she was going to buy a sewing machine with it. To make themselves desirable, the local women used a unique form of makeup, mud. They would spend all day long with a bucket of clay dug out of the river, and they would put these fanciful designs on their bodies, and they looked nice, it dried that way, and it was quite attractive. It was very, very attractive. Though he may have been tempted, Doc Abraham did not participate. I don't mind telling you, I was waiting for Kate when I got back home. It was well worth waiting for. By all accounts, Shangri-La and Paradise served the Army's purpose. I would say the Army did the right thing. It was a very successful thing. They cut down on the disease, the venereal rate, quite a bit. It didn't eliminate it. There's no program that'll do that. Shangri-La and Paradise remained top secret until the 1980s, when the government declassified most documents from World War II. Even then, the story didn't surface until George Abraham wrote his book. Well, it's part of history. I think people ought to know what happened, how the Army came to grips with a situation like that. And I commend the Army for doing it. In June 1944, the Allies invaded the beaches of Normandy. For many young, frightened, excited American GIs, D-Day was the start of months of treacherous combat. The battlefield accounts are numerous, but only now are veterans beginning to talk publicly about their sexual exploits in Europe. For most GIs, it began in France. Truly, a lot of French women were thrilled to see Americans and were grateful for their presence, thought that they had saved their lives. You have to consider the fact that after four years of occupation by the Germans, it was like you opened the cork and it all came out. John Kingsley went to France in September 1944. There at a small village in Normandy, he had his first contact with a French woman. That was a lady who was peddling you know what, and her name was Josie, and she spoke broken English, and my French wasn't too good. And I asked her, I said, Josie, uh, do you ever do this for love? And she said, quote, love, business is business, and Love, she is bullshit. I'll have a pack of cigarettes. Most GIs hardly had time for women because the Army was usually on the move, advancing tens of miles almost every day. But when they did stop, those who wanted sex could find it, and there were few restraints. Who are you answering to? Family? They're not there. Friends? They're not there. Your community, you're not in the community. Later on, you're not going to be there. You're going to be somewhere else. This was a, a paradise because, they, A, they didn't speak the language, and so there's no possibility of a very serious, profound relationship. And B, they knew they were going home and that the French women were going to stay. That's the way it was in France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg. Sidney Foreman's outfit the 39th Infantry Regiment landed at Omaha Beach on June 8, 1944. D-Day plus two. After liberating the port city of Cherbourg, the 39th chased Hitler's army back to Germany. Along the way, Foreman and his buddies saw a lot of combat and women. His book, D-Day to Victory, explicitly details his experience. It's a total, continuous story of the war through the eyes of the GI, including something that's generally left out, the sex. 
Nowhere was sex more available in France than in the heart of Paris. Just as the GIs had made a beeline for Piccadilly Circus in London, they headed straight to Pigalle, the red light district of Paris. Pigalle, yeah, but they called it Pigalle. Pigalle was an entertainment area and it had a lot of these music halls which dealt with that type of, of entertainment. The most famous cabaret in Pigalle was the Moulin Rouge. Like the Folies Bergère, it featured nude reviews. We were a little bit surprised at the amount of flesh you could see. I won't say that I was really prepared for that, but I wasn't that naive. I had seen and heard a lot more, but it did get to me. It also got to me because it was in an area where it is known for prostitution, and you couldn't pass the street without somebody saying, hey, GI, and being propositioned. For Sergeant John Kingsley, Paris became more than a brief treat. I got to Paris, and that was the story of what we would call La Grande Amour, the great love. And I met a young lady, and I had what later she described as le coup de fourde, which means a bolt of lightning. We went to a small hotel near the Gare de Lyon. She lived outside of Paris. And the next morning, it was a, a scene out of a farewell to arms. And we both uh, pledged eternal love and uh, don't forget me and come back and I'm waiting for you. And I did come back to her. John Kingsley went to France with the US Army in 1944. He stayed for 15 years with his French lover. Most of the time, when the French hear me speaking, the question always comes up, où avez-vous appris le français? Where have you learned French? Au lit. That means in bed. French beds may have also saved downed Allied airman Ernest King. After his B-17 was shot down in August 1943, he managed to hide from the Nazis for nine months. But then, just a month before D-Day, he was captured. King was interrogated and tortured by the Gestapo. During the torture, he said he thought about sex to keep his mind off the pain. You know, you, you gotta think back to some nice, nice deal. And I thought back about a whack, God bless her soul, that was in the service. That's the type of thing that I could focus my mind because, you know, I like sex, I like women. And I could get my mind completely away from what they was doing. King spent the rest of the war in a Luftwaffe prison camp. His self-published book, Beyond Fantasy, is the story of his experiences during the war. Just as they had done after the First World War, many American GIs returned to the United States after World War II with a different view toward male-female relations. Did our GIs learn anything about sex by being in Europe? My assumption is yes. They did become more sexually sophisticated. And maybe that's why they can talk more easily about it 60 years later. Slowly but surely, a complete picture of wartime behavior is emerging. First in the words of historians, but more importantly, in the words of the witnesses and participants, the GIs who were there, those who lived to tell about it.